excited to have you all here today. Uh, the topic that we're talking about is about learning and development. And before we get started with having Neil Grant, our speaker, speak today, I wanted to just remind you of a couple of things. We record these events, so if you do not want to be recorded, please turn off your cameras. Uh, while the presentation is going on, I ask that you just stay muted, but feel free to ask questions in the chat or raise your hand or speak up and ask a question during the presentation. Neil said he's more than willing to answer questions as he's presenting. But before we get started, I'm going to have Gail, our sponsor, uh, do an introduction for us. Thanks, Katie. I'm just going to share. Um, just going to share my screen and, and please tell me if I have the wrong one up again. Katie, is this it? OK? It's the wrong one again. The wrong one again. I don't know what it is. OK, so um, we don't want to do that. Let me do this. For some reason. Go up to the top and change it. I got it. I got it, I think. Okay. Did, did it change? No. OK, well, you know what? Let's just, I think you're just going to have to bear with me on this one then, because I don't know what the problem is. Um, anyway. Uh, so, so my name is Gail Norton. I'm with CMP. We are uh, career management partners. CMP is a, is a talent management firm. So, um, and I should say first, so I am the VP of client solutions with CMP. I'm also on the NHRC board. I always forget to say that. So I want to make sure to, uh, that you know who I am and, and why I'm even talking. So, uh, uh, as I mentioned, CMP is a talent management firm. We work with companies across the talent lifecycle, from talent acquisition to uh, talent development and assessment, and through uh, career transition and <clears throat> excuse me, outplacement. Um, you know, we are a, a minority and woman-owned business. So uh, overall, I mean, we're, we have a very heavy emphasis on DEI. You know, it's so important, and being a mi minority and woman-owned business. Only, only makes us focus on this more. So overall, uh, what we, yeah, I'm only gonna talk for, for a minute. I just wanna give you an overview. We're really happy to be sponsoring this program this morning, um, but from, what, uh, from a, an overview of what CMP has to offer, we do talent acquisition from executive search, professional level recruiting, and also uh, consulting on talent strategy. Um, we also have in, in the talent development realm, we do assessments. Uh, we have a, a practice that is focused on assessments of, of all types. Um, you know, a, a lot of the things that we're working on right now are um, assessing the, the executive teams for organizations. Um, but we do, we do work with, with all levels as far as assessments and also coaching and development. So executive coaching and development side and then outplacement. So anything across the helping helping um, people transition out of the organization. So anything across the talent life cycle is what we work on. If we can do anything for you, please feel free to reach out. Here's my contact information. Uh, and you know, thanks for letting me sponsor. I'm looking forward to the program. Katie, do you, Neil, you want to go ahead? I can very, very easily do that. Let me put my screen up. There we go. Good. Well, pleased to meet you, everyone, today. Before I do some introductions, why don't we do this and get used to using the chat feature? So uh, you'll find a chat box on Zoom. Why don't you just post in chat uh, where you're joining from today? Uh, it'd be nice to kind of get a selection of geographical locations as to where you're from. I'll put mine in. All right, everyone's in. Okay, I'm going to be more specific. <laughs> Excellent. Everyone's, we could be meeting in person. Wouldn't that be great? Uh, we're not that far away. We could have all kind of gathered somewhere around about, I don't know, Lake Zurich in the middle of somewhere where everyone is. Uh, that, that'd be great. Look, nice to know where everyone is today. And um, I'm based in Long Grove uh, in uh, Illinois. Uh, despite the accent, which you'll uh, be discerning enough to know is an English accent, but I've lived here in Chicago for the last um, been nine years in, in September. So nice to meet you all. Um, so this is a bit of a background as to who I am. I work for Corn Ferry. 
Uh, you might have heard of Corn Ferry before. We're a global organization development consultancy. Uh, I work a lot in the custom leadership development side, um, and I do a lot of executive coaching at the moment. So, Gail, we're kind of uh, in similar areas. Uh, I'm probably coaching about 40 clients right now. Um, through the pandemic, uh, coaching was something that blew up a lot, uh, as it, of course it can be done quite effectively in a virtual environment. And uh, I've worked for Corn Ferry for three years. Um, I've done a lot of senior consulting work before that, um, mainly based out of the UK, uh, but a lot internationally. Um, so some of the companies I worked for in the US, I worked for Grant Thornton for two and a half years, uh, designing a new partner pipeline program for them, um, and a few others, but I've worked for, for Unilever, for British Aerospace, for Shell, Anyway, a variety of companies, pretty industry agnostic. And I've had a, had a blast of a career and enjoying it a lot. Um, so just a couple of things. Uh, I'm sure you kind of know the, know the drill in terms of these, these, these programs, but please do jump in and participate. So when I say, it'd be lovely to hear from a few people, uh, please don't hesitate uh, and just jump in, jump in and talk to me because otherwise I'll feel very, feel very lonely. Um, Cell phones, you know, things will interrupt. Don't worry too much about them. If, if your kids invade the room, be lovely to see them. If your cat walks across the screen, that'd be fine. Um, we're, we're all used to that in the virtual world. Uh, but try to pay, uh, be attentive, at least for the next uh, 30 minutes while I'm talking, then you can do whatever you like. Um, but um, mute other things and uh, just let us know who you are when you're gonna contribute. Video cameras, I think, as you mentioned, you, you know, your comfort level. Uh, when you, when you do want to kind of contribute, by the way, it'd be great to see you. So do turn your video cameras on when you do want to kind of say something. Uh, if you're not familiar with Zoom, because we're all do, using different, uh, different platforms these days, uh, you will find some features where you can actually change your name if you want to um, uh, on the renaming tool, the chat box. Most of you have found that okay. Uh, and then there's some participant tools. I'm not going to be tool heavy because I know some people don't uh, are familiar with Zoom, so I'm only going to use chat and um, just take yourself off, off audio and talk to me today. We're not going to do polling or breakouts or, or any of those sorts of things. Um, so those of you that are used to working with different platforms, maybe you've been using WebEx or Teams or Amazon Chime or Google uh, Meets. Uh, Meet. So, so there, there are many, many platforms, of course, which people are using these days. Um, all right, so let's jump into what we're going to kind of cover. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about virtual learning um, in, of course, the, the, the pandemic world. It feels like a long time ago, and I sympathize with, I can't remember who was it said, they just met, went back to the office for the first time since last year. Uh, me too, I went down to our offices in downtown Chicago on Friday. Uh, it was a ghost town. It's so sad to see downtown Chicago looking so empty. Uh, having been used to seeing it as a hub of activity with, with food trucks and gazillions of people walking around the streets. Uh, fingers crossed it's going to get back there. It'd be great to see that. And of course, we've been on this journey for a while now, um, probably 14 months or so, um, 13, 13, 14 months, well, probably more, 14, 15 months since the pandemic really, really hit us. Uh, and that's changed all of our lives in many, many, many ways. But I'm going to talk specifically about learning and how we've adapted to learning um, really into the way that, that we've adapted to it and the way that we've been experiencing that with our clients too. Um, some of these slides, by the way, I'm not going to read what's on them. I'm going to let you browse through them as, as we kind of talk. But you know that, that things have changed enormously. Um, and I think we'll change indefinitely as well. Um, I've heard so many stories about people saying, I don't really want to go back to the office full time. Um, or so other people going saying, I, I really want to get back to the office, um, but I, I've, I've also valued some of the, the benefits of working remotely. Uh, but with the advance of the pandemic, um, the whole learning and development landscape changed. I think in 2020, I was scheduled to be traveling every two weeks to client sites, um, doing leadership programs, facilitating events. And of course, none of that happened after March. Uh, that's changed. I don't see that reversing the way that, that going back to the way that it was. Um, and we've all had to learn new ways of doing things, there's ways of working as well as ways of learning as well. Um, and I think to, you know, thinking about COVID-19 changing the, the nature of work, I think it will have a, a, a very long lasting um, effect on, on the world of work, let alone the world of learning. Um, some of the things around, around learning, 
you know, it, it, it's more than just converting face-to-face -face methods of learning to virtual methods. Um, some, uh, some people have said, well, I just need to change my in-person program to a, a Zoom session or a WebEx session. I think it's more than that. It's about, it's really thinking deeply about, about what does learning need to be in a virtual world? How do we need to do it different, differently? How do we make it accessible immediately and, and practice-based and, and iterative? How do we build communities? Because we've lost the dynamics of being face-to-face. -face. Um, and I think, you know, some of these slides are probably a little bit last year, a little, a little bit, I think in the top right-hand one, we can't wait. No, we couldn't wait. Uh, any company that was in learning development had to, had to step up and react immediately. Uh, we went into a very fast-paced conversion exercise starting last March to convert everything into virtual learning. So a lot of our generic uh, learning programs, we actually converted initially into Adobe Connect because we thought it was a very flexible um, environment in which to learn. I would say it's a flexible learning environment or platform to learn, but it's also quite complex. So we then converted everything into Zoom as well, which I prefer, it's, it's much easier. Um, but then of course we had different ways of, of, of uh, having to resource those learning programs and had to go through a reskilling re re exercise internally as well. Um, I'm going to keep moving on slides. If you want to jump in or, or you raise a hand or put something in the chat box, please do. I'm more than happy to take um, a conversational approach to this presentation rather than just to speak to you all the time. But I'm going to keep moving through fairly quickly on the slides. Um, but what I'd like you to do is put into the chat box First of all, how many of the companies that you represent, so how many of, of your employers or clients that you serve are providing 100% virtual learning to develop talent? Um, if the answer to that is yes, or is, is 100%, then put yes in the chat box. If you're doing things other than virtual learning, put no. Or, or coaching for that matter. We've got a few no's, a few yeses. I would say mainly yeses. We've got a couple of no's, which is fascinating. Um, so I'm gonna be very awkward now and call on a couple of people. Well, how about you, you take the opportunity? So um, Elizabeth, Lynn, or Michael, do you wanna take yourself off mute and tell me what you're doing, which is not virtual learning? Um, um, I so, can go. This is Michael uh, Lopresti. Um, we work a lot with manufacturing companies. So um, it was a, virtual for a little while, but has been a lot of the essential businesses and things like that. So we're still, um, we definitely moved, you know, probably 50, 60% to virtual, um, especially with our internal team doing a lot more virtual, but um, forklift training, things like that, just kind of have to be hands-on and done in, in person. Um, so that's the type of stuff that we're doing that just can't be done virtually. Yeah, thanks, Michael. I understand that. Yeah, working in a forklift truck simulator, I can't imagine that works. Uh, who else was going to contribute? Um, this is Elizabeth. Uh, so I work for a staffing firm as well. We mainly work with like manufacturing and healthcare clients. So also essential workers. So a lot of our clients are not uh, willing to do anything remotely. So um, they are looking for candidates who are available 100% on site. Um, and that's starting from the very beginning with the onboarding all the way to um, training and learning and development and all of that. Thanks, Elizabeth. That's really interesting. and I. I I can understand the industry specific nature of the way that some people have done, either gone full virtual or, or not. Um, I've noticed in the last few months, a few clients are saying, well, we want to schedule something in person uh, for later in the year. Uh, I met somebody face to face for some coaching. I've actually met another, another guy recently for breakfast uh, for some coaching. It has to be mutually agree agreed on. You know, he wanted to, I wanted to. Uh, and we can do that. But I would say that there's probably a predominance of organizations that are very conservative right now on, um, on getting back to in-person uh, in connections. Um, 
So I think it, it, I think it's a mixture uh, industry wise. I really understand the mix. But let's keep going in terms of some of what we're going to cover this morning. So thinking about design principles, practices, and methods, uh, some of the things that might be worth talking about. Uh, I don't think that the principles of adult learning have changed much um, because they were good in the first place and they still stand. So development needs to be uncomfortable. It needs to be disturbed um, mindsets, needs to disturb um, knowledge, needs to kind of really make people feel that they're going through a transition and developing new skills and new behaviors. Uh, growth mindset, people need to really leave things behind and, uh, and, and really appreciate they can change and commit to learning and commit to change. And that whole sense of group accountability as well is super important. We have eight principles which are along the, the bottom of the screen. Uh, I don't intend on making this a marketing conversation in terms of how great Corn Ferry is, uh, although great Corn Ferry is great, but you can read those. Uh, but they're principles that we use around, uh, around learning and development uh, cons consistently. And um, we still try to keep those relevant in the virtual world as well. So how do you create stress? Well, I could just create the stress by asking two of you to jump on and talk to me. Um, you can create stress in lots of different ways. Uh, but actually also uncomfortably put, uh, develop learning content which continues to disturb people's norms. Um, emo emotion is important. You know, I think, I think probably one of the things I think has impressed me more and more is that facilitators and people who contribute to learning almost need to have become more animated in the virtual world than they are when they're in person. When you're in person, you're on stage, you can kind of walk around, you can chat to people, connect with people. But when you're sat in front of a co computer, the, the, the temptation is for people to just go into computer mode and talk to a screen. But I think for presenters and facilitators, you've got to imagine you're in a room talking to real people and add some emotion, add some, um, some movement into the way that you're actually connecting with people. And I don't think that's everyone's, to use an English phrase, everyone's cup of tea. Um, I don't think it really works for everyone. I think some people lean into that more than others. But I think it's an intentional thing that, that facilitators have needed to adapt to uh, and to become better facilitators as a result. Uh, I think we're going to see that in, in the learning and development area. I think people will be, will be better at engaging with other people than they, they ever have been. Um, the range of methods we use still, still matters. Um, action planning, you know, we, we're doing action planning differently in some of our learning um, interventions. Instead of leaving it to the very end of a program and saying, well, let's, like, let's write an action plan, we do action planning all the way through a program. So every, every hour, we're asking people to update an action plan with something that they've, just, they've just learned. So it's much more dynamic and iterative than it ever has been. And I think that's probably going to carry over into any face-to-face -face learning that, that's, uh, that, that's carried on after the pandemic. Uh, real work issues, we, we really do find that Probably most learning happens when people talk to their colleagues and their peers about real work issues. So when you're running a session like this, and we might go into breakout group and say, well, how have you found that in your, in your, uh, in, in your workplace? Those are some of the richest times of learning and exchanging, uh, exchanging ideas. Assessments, we use a lot of assessments just to give um, data really for people to work on, to understand themselves better, 360s or personality profiling uh, are always very, uh, very important. I would say technology is, is one of the biggest, um, almost threshold requirements for virtual learning. Um, Gail probably was a great demonstration of that at the beginning. Gail, thanks so much for setting us up for this. Uh, the, the need to kind of know which screen you're showing at any point in time. Gail, sorry, that wasn't meant to kind of, you know, make you feel awkward. But, that, but point in question, you know, when you're doing virtual learning, what you see on your screen, is that what they're seeing on their screen? Um, when I had my video on, do I mean to have my video on? Um, when I have my audio on, is that in intentional or am I saying things that I, I don't want them to hear? All of those things about working in the virtual world, we've got to really think through very, very carefully and, and make it work for other people. I'm not gonna go through reading the rest of it because you've probably read it through by now already. Um, but I do think in involving leaders as teachers, just to mention the last one, super important, have people who are in the business talk to, to their colleagues about, about the company and about their, the application of learning. Um, what we gain from virtual? Well, there's a number of things. Um, one of the things that we, we, we quite often do is, is break learning down into much smaller chunks than we ever did. Um, so some learning programs, and I'll, I'll show a few examples at the end, 
we might have an hour of learning and then people get back to their work or three hours and then get back to work. Uh, maybe that's part of a learning journey. So we get them to do some learning and then apply what they've learned and then come back and talk about it next time or we'll talk about it in a, a group coaching session. So that learning at work, learning integrated into work, far more effective, I would say, in virtual learning than it was in person. Journeys are truly the backbone. Uh, we very rarely just deliver standalone programs. We do uh, for clients, uh, but we try to integrate learning into journeys. And I'm, I'm gonna show you some learning journey examples at the end. Uh, flexibility, of course, probably, is one of the great things about virtual learning. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Scheduling, if you're doing shorter sessions, people don't need to travel, don't need to arrange hotels, we don't need to arrange um, venues for delivering training. It's way easier to schedule. All of those things uh, are, signif are significant advantages. One of the things, by the way, I was talking to somebody yesterday, they were saying that, um, that when it was in person, of course, you incurred the cost of travel and accommodation and the thought now of going back to in-person learning, incurring those costs of travel and accommodation again, are sticking in the throats of quite a few <laughs> CFOs and, uh, and people that manage the expenses of firms. So that's gonna be a challenge of going back to in-person learning. Um, you can read the rest of them, scaling, um, access, personal development, instead of pulling them away, Okay, uh, let's let's move on. Neil, quick question for you. So are you seeing a lot more companies doing cohorts in small learning sessions because of that? Yes. Um, of course, it depends what type of learning you're doing. If, if you're doing learning that, that is more interactive, yeah, cohort learning is, is, um, is very common. People can still do self-paced learning if they want to do e-learning. Uh, you can still do that. I wouldn't say that is a massively effective way of, of learning it's more information kind of um onboarding but yeah cohort learning a lot of it i mean it's great that's a way of building community it's a way of actually getting people to talk to each other and and mimicking a little bit of what we enjoyed when we were more in person good question uh here's another question for you so maybe you can take yourself off mute and uh put yourself on video to answer this one what other positives have you seen in converting to virtual learning? Anyone that's done that, want to jump on and talk to me about any other things that they've experienced which have been good things? Um, I can say something real quick. I, uh, I noticed that there's a higher participation rate in virtual learning than there was in in-person. Good point. Are you see, are, and why is that? Because the the the, uh, the modules are shorter. People don't have to travel. What's the reason for that? Do you think? Uh, I think it's all of the above. I think it's a lot of not having to travel somewhere. Um, just having like a shorter presentation. Um, being able to kind of take or do things in their own time because like virtual learning you don't necessarily have to do it at a specific time you can kind of pick your time during the day so you don't you can pick like your last busy time okay if that makes sense yeah no good thanks elizabeth anyone else what other positives have you seen i also see that people are uh, can work it into their schedule um more efficiently in their at least in their minds you know so it's it's easier i see more people um participating because there's I, I think it's a combination of things it's it's shorter but they don't have to travel so they don't lose all that travel time they don't they they can go from a learning to a meeting to you know whatever so a lot of um uh, flexibility yeah I agree, Gail. I think, and both Elizabeth and Gail, both your points, I think, are so, so true. Uh, people can accommodate shorter learning modules into their calendars more so than say, hey, I've got to go away for the three day program and I've got to go to the other side of the world to do that. Uh, that took up a lot of time. Yeah. And I think people being able to slide in 
shorter modules is is way more effective. And I think the the the, the, the engagement piece, um, you know, we just had an experience there. You know, think when you're when you're in a virtual world, you have potentially got more distractions, phones going off, people walking into your room, uh, the front doorbell ringing, you know, dogs walking around your feet. Also. You probably didn't have those so much when you were in person, but I think we probably all learned to probably embrace those as, uh, as this is humanity, this is life, rather than a sterile kind of environment. So I think there's been all sorts of things that are, that are upsides to, to virtual learning. I think for me anyway, I've been able to connect with my team better. It's been lovely to see members of my team who just had new babies and the babies have been on calls and uh, I, you know, I love it when kids come in and say hi uh, it, it's just fantastic and we've done that in the middle of learning programs um, sometimes in learning programs people have talked about instruments they they can play and I said love to hear you play something for the rest of the cohort usually people get scared when I say that and get embarrassed <laughs> and don't do it but it it, it, it brings people into co connection with each other way more than perhaps we used to be able to so a lot, of, a lot of upsides. All right, let's keep going. Um, compensating features. Uh, by the way, I, I think I can make these, these slides available. I don't know if, if you want me to send them through afterwards, but certainly we can make these available so you can have them. So you don't have to read all these and digest it all as we go through. Um, you know, this is an interesting one, the first one. The natural energy and excitement in emergent and spontaneous networking conversations with people at your table in white space meals, which was kind of in-person work. Can you mitigate through virtual learning to a degree, social breakouts, touch points. I'm a pragmatist. Um, I think you know, we are human beings not intended to communicate only over Zoom for the rest of our lives. Uh, and, and I think there's something about being in person which is irreplaceable. Something about the, the, the exchanges of, of, uh, of, of of seeing each other face to face, of, of just seeing each other kind of move around the room and, and being able to stand up and do something on a whiteboard or a flip chart and, 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 and all of those sorts of things. Even the things that used to annoy me about facilitating, like people walking out the room to go to the bathroom in the middle of a session. I'm kind of, kind of, kind of okay with that now because that's kind of, that's sort of life. Anyway, so maybe I've changed too as a facilitator as well. But a lot, a lot of the other things, in the virtual world, I think we've really tried to develop learning experiences which, which engage people and don't settle for, well, we can't really replicate this because it's, it's virtual. Well, let's find a way to kind of mitigate against some of the things that, uh, that we used to enjoy in, in person. And I think we, we can do that really, really well. Some design shifts we've had to make, simplify content. I think no doubt about that. Um, some content perhaps we had uh, maybe sophisticated simulations, although we do run virtual simulations, um, perhaps those have had to be simplified. Some of the ways activities, you can't just say, let's all go outside and do something uh, to break up the flow, uh, but you can do things differently. I was on a learning program the other day with a client where we did a, um, we did a, a virtual paint night at the end of the evening. Um, you can do a lot of things inventively to make uh, to make learning fun. Um, you'll see in, in the next slide a lot of the the interactive features of tools we use to the maximum um, extent. I would say some platforms are still catching up. So, for example, Teams is only just catching up with being able to when you're in breakout groups, being able to jump for a facilitator to be jumped between rooms. I think that feature is only just about going to be turned on in the next, the next few weeks. And I think breakout rooms were only possible at the end of last year. Zoom had its issues early on in terms of security, but I think they've mainly, mainly tackled those. I think some of the other uh, platforms are, are less flexible in terms of the way that you can, you can use interactive um, uh, features. Limit lecture time. I'm breaking all the rules here because I'm talking to you a lot more because this is more of a, more of a presentation. Uh, rather than perhaps a learning experience. Um, technology, okay, energy breaks. Usually we kind of make sure that people get plenty of breaks. Breakouts are always a, a lot of fun and so on. And you can, you can see those the rest of the slide. Um, the, these are some of the things that we use regularly. Breakouts, polling, um, getting people to share verbally, 
um, okay, we, we kind of time things, there's a breaks on the rest of it, interactive workbooks, interactive PDFs for people to update as they go through, chats, writing text on screen, uh, stamping, um, drawing on screen, and of course, being on webcam. And all of those, if we're designing a learning program uh, using uh, Zoom or Adobe Connect, we use all of those actively, almost every other slide, uh, if not every slide, to try to have some interactive uh, experience as we go through a, a virtual learning program. I, I, I can't think I've run any any programs um, which which don't have these scattered uh, very very liberally through the program. Uh, preparation shifts. Um, so a lot of need to prepare for learning for learning. Um, we quite often have a producer who manages things like breakout groups and polling and things like that. So manages the technical side brings people in and out of the programs, as well as the facilitator. So the facilitator doesn't have to do all of, all of that. Also, I would say, if you're doing any longish programs, so I would say three plus hours, uh, it's always great to have numerous facilitators just to get a change of voice. Also really helps the facilitator from getting completely worn out, which um, happens frequently. Um, so preparation, technology rehearsal, super important, uh, so that we know it's all gonna work. Really know your know your platform. So know how to use chat. Know what happens when you click on participants. Know what happens when you when you click on the uh, the, the annotate tools. Uh, know how to use it so that you're not caught out in the middle of a program saying, "I don't know how to help you." When someone when someone needs some help. So really know that and practice using it really really well. Um, you know, so Neil, Neil, yeah. and um, to that, you know. Um, just with the technology, uh, it just just like this morning. I, I mean, I use Zoom all the time and I share my screen. But, you know, at some point, something's going to happen and you just have to. And I think that's one of the things that, at least for me, you know, I used to really, it used to really throw me, um, you know, when that kind of thing happened and it would be so embarrassing. And all that, but, but things happen. So you, and, and that's what I've seen, you know, as we get more mature in using uh, virtual learning or virtual presentations or everything virtual, you know, people are relaxing a lot um, with with the, with small things that happen. So what? So you see a couple of slides, you know, I mean, it and it was it's very different from the beginning. People are um, much more comfortable with things. And I think that's one of the positives that's really come out of it. It is, Gail. The, the, the exception I would say to that is when you're working with technology companies, <laughs> then, then they get really frustrated. You can't work the technology. Yeah, uh, true. So true. yeah, there's always exceptions to that. I think you're right, and and you know, I think it, I think it's really important in virtual learning just to relax and be mm -hmm. to your point, Gail. To just be, be a human being. Don't be this machine because you're staring at a machine, but don't be a machine. Mm -hmm. um, be, be a human being. Be able to socialize. Be able to interact with people. Call people out, you know. Just just have a laugh with people and, and enjoy it. Uh, you know, we're we're having a stressy enough time as it is working virtually, so enjoy the learning while you can. Yeah, Neil, to add on to that, like the thing that I've noticed is a lot about making people feel safe in their environment. So there's been a lot of training with leaders about psychologically making it a safe environment, and it kind of connects to what Gil was saying. Like you bring the whole you to work now, and people are now more open to you maybe um, having your kiddo jump on or your dog or cat jump up during a meeting where prior, you know, people would probably judge or think that's unprofessional. No, you're, you're, you're very right. Uh, you're very right. And, uh, and I think um, you've, you've probably experienced it. I'm trying to think of the most bizarre experience I've had. I think, I think seeing, seeing teenagers walk behind their mom ducking down because they don't want to be seen on screen is, is always quite a fun one and you think I just saw that person walk behind you <laughs> uh, uh, th there's been a lot of fun times and I, I, I always draw attention to those things I never try to kind of hide them because uh, we need those light-hearted moments in, in learning and in life and uh, I think the more we can embrace them the better so I, I agree with you uh, a little bit on delivery shifts um, Producers, um, we never used to have producers. Uh, you know, it's the facilitator doing everything in person. Now we have producers who, who manage the technical background of managing a, a Zoom call or a, or a, a Adobe Connect call. 
as I say, we, we use breakouts a lot. We use polling a fair amount um, and uh, certainly getting somebody to bring people in and out of rooms and, and manage all that is, is, is really helpful in addition to the facilitator. I'm not sure I would like to just try to do that myself. I've done it a couple of times. There's just a lot of moving parts. Um, I think the start and end on time is important too, by the way. I think, I think a lot, we've got to respect people. Um, probably many of you during the day are in back-to-back -back meetings, virtual meetings, where you've just got to jump off one call and on straight onto the next one and switch your attention. Uh, we, we've lost some of, I think, the um, just some of the spacing out of things a little bit more now because you're, you're virtual. People just fill up your calendar with meetings. And probably actually your discipline needs to be to put some do not schedule time in there. So you're not back to back if you can, which is always a challenge. But try and stay at start and end on time. A high energy host that, you know, when you get a low energy host, boy, it kills you, doesn't it? And uh, you tell me if I'm low or high energy. And I hope I haven't killed any of you just yet, but uh, I'm finishing, finishing very soon. Uh, but it's a challenge to kind of keep that energy up. Uh, and so on. You, you can read the rest of the comments there as well. Um, different kinds of learning webinars, which are a little bit more, this is kind of a pseudo webinar. I'm just kind of telling you lots of, lots of stuff. We've got some interactivity, but not as, not as much as we might have in a learning program. E-learning is self-driven learning. There's pretty much no interaction other than with the, uh, the, the computer itself. And a virtual classroom experience, which is what we would use as a learning experience, is, is highly interactive. Uh, so it's trying to mimic the, the classroom in a virtual way. So different, uh, different ways of, of learning. Uh, one more question. Um, what has been the reaction to converting in-person to virtual learning? Maybe put a couple of things in, in the chat box uh, rather than talk virtually. Um, what sort of reactions have you seen? Have, have people loved it, hated it? Um, are people engaging in it? Would like more of it? What are, what are you seeing? Maybe a couple of people want to just put something in the chat box. Those of you that are still doing a lot of in-person stuff won't say too much. Short trainings people love, long trainings not so much. Yep. Engaging, adjusting, like the time saving, miss the person interaction, social conversation. Yeah, I miss the karaoke in the evenings too. That's uh, that was always fun. creating relationships with our team members. That's why I really hope that we don't all just settle for virtual living. <laughs> we need to build relationships. Group liked it, adjusted the schedules. Um, people wanted to work from home, can't wait to see each other again. I agree with you, a big time. Yeah, a lot of a lot of, kind of a mixed bag, I would say. And I think it is a mixed bag across, across individuals, across companies um, and across industries as well. Let's kind of just finish, finish things off. Just some examples for you. Of converting to virtual. Here's, here's three examples of, of learning journeys that we would create. Um, so these are kind of short module classrooms. And by short modules, half days are short modules for us. Uh, we do some one hour sessions, but primarily it's half days, just to get really into learning and get people to exchange ideas with each other, get breakout groups going together. Um, so this is an example, pulling together lots of different topics in half days. So we, broke, we break down lots of our one day courses into half days, and you can just string them together like this in, in, a, learning, in a learning journey over how long you want to do. So let's say there's eight sessions. You can do that over a couple of months. You can do that over three months, however long people have got. I think that's one of the things about flexible learning. You can say, well, half a day a week is probably too much. Half a day every two weeks, that might work for us. You can, you can adapt that uh, in, in a virtual world where you couldn't do so much in, in person. Um, we still do um, events where you're stringing together lots of different activities. So here's some examples. You're doing assessments. Actually, I just did a three-day workshop with a client. We are doing those still in a virtual environment. They're challenging. I think they really stretch the design of the program, but hey, Who's not up for a challenge as a learning professional? How do you do a learning program for three days, eight hours a day to make it fun, interactive, engaging, and inspiring? There's a challenge for a learning professional rather than say, oh, we shouldn't be doing this. Well, 
I'd look the opposite way around. Let's let's kind of rise to the challenge and make it work. Uh, so building in coaching, work-based projects, uh, assessments, um, team team activities, and and workshops. Uh, that's another example of, of a learning journey that really works well. Uh, and this is a much more complicated one, much more senior le senior leadership group, where you've got a real mixture of um, uh, of, of executive lab series and speaker series and projects and coaching and, and really mixing the whole thing together in a, in a very integrated learning, learning journey. This is for a technology company. Actually, we run this over, I think it's about three to four, three, three months total. So there is a lot, they get something every single week. And it was just a decision made by that client to actually put together a, uh, a really tight program with a, a lot happening every week. So this is another example of, of a learning journey. Um, so that's my last question. What do you see as the future? Um, maybe you want to put something in the chat box. What does the future look like? Are we all going back to in-person learning? Um, is the role of the facilitator going to change a lot? Do you never want to facilitate a virtual program ever again? Uh, what do you what, what's what's in your mind that says the future landscape for learning hybrid learning a little bit of both freedom combo hybrid mix of both more of a hybrid i think than probably we thought before we started down this track last year um yeah it, it works I, I agree with everyone that says it works you know i think there's a lot to say for for, for virtual learning it saves saves money, saves time, um, can still be super effective. I think it would be ideal to blend it together with some personal experience of actually engaging with each other. So I think it would work. I think that's a challenge for us as learning and development prof professionals uh, to how to develop our skill set uh, to be really relevant in a, in, a, in, a, in a hybrid world, to be good virtual facilitators, good virtual trainers, um, good designers, um, like the idea of, of learning, getting out of a classroom, uh, as a trainer, we can be more dynamic and change your L&D in the businesses. Yep. Learn how to blend the, the, the virtual with the activity based, with the project based, with, with all of those other things that we perhaps used to just, just see through, through a, a, more, a narrow lens. I think it's broadened our lens. I think we've got more options. And I think as people become more comfortable being face to face again, I think we should use those options to the max, our maximum advantage. Okay, I'm gonna stop now and uh, stop talking. I, was, I did say to the team that once they told me to shut up, I would shut up, no one told me to shut up. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna self uh, discipline myself and stop talking and open it up to any questions that people would like to talk about on any topic that we've discussed in the last uh, 30, 40 minutes or so. So please take yourself off mute, jump on video, and uh, let's have a conversation to end up our time. Neil, are yes. you seeing, in, with your clients, are you seeing more people that are wanting to, um, to, to be in person um, or, or saying that they like hybrid? I mean, what, what are your clients saying? Yeah, the, the, the nearest in-person learning program that I have on my calendar is November in Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, fingers crossed, because <laughs> getting to November, Florida in November out of Chicago is probably a good thing to do. Um, I have a client that was hoping to do Berlin in November. That's now moved to next June. Uh, so more than a year away, I think people are super nervous, especially with some parts of the world. Mainland Europe is really nervous right now about not jumping too quickly. Plus, if you've got people traveling from other geographies, I mean, you, 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 couldn't, you couldn't have a program where you, you, you opened it up to people from mainland Europe, from, um, from, from India, from, uh, from New Zealand, Australia. You just can't do that right now. And I don't think you'll be able to do that in 2021. Yeah. So I, I think we've we got people who are high aspirations, but really nervous about jumping too quickly. 
You know, we see too, um, even within the states, there are some states that are way open and then here, and we are not, you know, so, and it's, it's, a, it's a considerable difference. Yep. I, I hope that there'll be some shifting around uh, kind of late summer, uh, once kind of the level of hopefully vaccinations are higher um, and we start to see some, you know, relaxing of social guidelines and CDC guidelines get a bit more, a bit more relaxed. I think companies will start to ease off. I still think that there'll be a, a big challenge for, but if you're an HR professional, uh, how will you respond to an individual who says, I don't feel safe traveling on public transport uh, for another two years? Do you respect that? Do you kind of say, well, okay, <laughs> we'll just, you just won't be able to take advantage of some of those activities? I think there's some challenges for us still uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the next 24 months. Totally agree with that and hear that from clients as well, that as they want to start to return and bring employees back, they're getting pushed back. And so it, it's a, becoming a huge HR issue. What do you do, especially if it's required learning, right? Because for many organizations, investing in the technology to do both the live and remote at the same time is a huge investment. I, we're looking at that for a couple of associations right now. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. And I think you're right. It, it's it's a it's a tricky issue. I do think at some point in time, and this is my my personal view, that um, we can't remain paralyzed by this. We're going to have to get unstuck, mm -hmm. uh, and that really is is a is a conversation I think we need to have with everybody that works close to us. Um, and if you if you lead a team, that's a conversation you should probably having with with your team now. Um, about how to find find a way of of of, um, of getting into a way of working which actually allows some flexibility. Um, I think that the virtual learning option is going to be around for forever, um, mm -hmm. and the hybrid model I think will be around forever. Um, and that's why I think we should lean into this with a, a lot of um, a lot of commitment. As, as learning professionals, find ways of doing things better, find tools, go online, search for tools, uh, that, find ways of doing online whiteboarding, uh, better you know, threaded discussion groups, better interactive project team working, uh, collaboration groups. We've got, to be, we've got to be on top of this and not kind of fear it. So I think it's an opportunity for us. What other observations or questions have people got? Neil, just a, a tool question, if you would. You mentioned uh, interactive workbook. I'm yep. not familiar with that. I mean, I'm doing a lot of cohort learning and training, and the good news is you validated for me today that I'm on the right path. But you know, we're sending out um, materials ahead of time, and one thing we ran into early on was with some of these people, they didn't have printers at home to even print. So I ended up mailing workbooks and documents and then also sending electronic copies. So can you talk a little bit about interactive workbook? So it's using um, PDFs. So creating interactive PDFs using Adobe. Um, okay. Where you can effectively you're creating kind of online books, as it were, uh, online workbooks, where you can write into the, into the workbook, you can, uh, you, can, you can update action planning, uh, you, can, uh, you can complete questionnaires in a workbook. So it's just creating something that's online rather than uh, a physical book, which people write into. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. What other questions are there? Do you have a, um, I know you gave us a lot of ideas and information, but like you said, doing virtual learning can't just take kind of the on face-to-face -face and, and turn it over, right? I think there's kind of tricks. Do you have any books or resources, best way to kind of research, you know, how to deliver um, kind of the virtual meeting, virtual presentation, um, you know, kind of a, 
general training, I would say, um, on the best, you know, kind of tricks. Yeah. yeah, but I should write, you should write one, Michael. You and I should partner. We should, <laughs> should write a book. Um, I'm pretty sure the resources, I haven't read any books on being a good virtual facilitator. Um, there's probably plenty online if you, if you search for it around good techniques for, for virtual delivery. Um, I may be able to actually at attach something to this slide deck, which I send, send through to the, the folks to distribute to, to you afterwards which might have that as well. Um, you know, to, to be totally honest with you, and I'm being very candid here, I, I, I haven't had any formal training as to how to do virtual facilitation. Uh, I, have, I have learned from some really good people. So I, I, think, I would say that would, that would be something I would recommend you do. Uh, watch other people um, and, and learn some of the ways in which they do it really well. Um, I, I find that you know, energy for me is something that, that, that I, I need to continually look at. How do I create that energy in my own voice, in my intonation, um, uh, when I'm doing some, some learning? Because I can get, kind of get pretty monotone sometimes. Uh, so that's something I'm learning. I think we've all got our, our own ways of learning. You know, the, the ways you use back, the background to, to your room. Now, I have no background on my screen. You can just see my office behind me. Some people have ridiculous backgrounds. And every time they move, their head is kind of blurring. Uh, please don't do that. Yes, you can create a blurred background if you don't want to see people, you know, for people to see, you know, your family photographs behind you or something like that. But sometimes it's just, it's just watch yourself on screen. And if every time you move because you've decided to do a, a green, you know, a, a green screen background, your head kind of blurs out. T turn it off. Do something better. Um, Scarily, I was on a call the other day, and if you use Zoom, you can actually customize um, your your uh, your video. You can, and if you know that, you can actually put makeup on. You can do eyebrows. You can put beards. You can put glasses. I actually was uh, in a session the other day, and I had these white eyebrows, and I don't know how it happened, um, but some somehow I had either customized my own kind of video where I was, or I had white eyebrows. Anyway, I had to turn those off really quickly. So. Be aware of, of how you look when, when, you're, when you're talking. Where are you on the screen? Can people see your head and shoulders? You know, I still see some people training like, like, like this. Look at yourself on the camera. You know, that doesn't work for people. It reminds me of my mother when I gave her her first iPad and all I saw was that. You know, we don't want to see that. <laughs> so really it's, it's learning get other people to give you feedback. Um, Michael, I haven't given you a great answer, but it, it's, it's watch yourself, learn from great people, be human, be con conversational, be confident, learn the technology, uh, know the materials back to front, uh, learn, Gail, ha when you've got presentation mode on your screen and when you use the other screen. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, Neil. <laughs> I couldn't switch it, I don't know. <laughs> But learn how to laugh things, at it. No, no, sorry, Gal, you're a good sport. Um, learn all of those things so that you can just be a natural in front of people. Um, that's all I'd say. I would say you know, that, that, that's a really that. good point, Neil, because I mean, it's very distracting when people are not, you know, when, when you're looking at this or, or this. I see a lot of, you're right, I see a lot of people with their cameras aimed at the ceiling or up their nose. You know, I mean, how can you concentrate on what's being said when all you see is just something you don't want to see? I agree. And uh, I noticed the host just muted me. So that mean I need to shut up. <laughs> no, Neil, you're okay. I was trying to unmute me on accident and I unmuted you. <laughs> Please don't make sure the user knows what they're doing. I was going to say we have a couple of minutes left. So I just want to make sure if we can ask one more question, Neil. And then Denise, I know you can do an announcement about our next round table that we're having. So any other questions for Neil? Neil, I have one question for you. You mentioned team building and you gave the example about the art. Do you have other suggestions about team building activities that leaders can put on with their team? I've heard people that have done all sorts of things. They've done, they've done cooking classes, they've done wine tasting. Um, what else have they done? Um, you can actually do a, a virtual escape room as well. Um, so I, I would just, those, those are some things I've heard. I haven't done the virtual escape room myself. 
Uh, but um, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that you can find some other examples online. Thank you, Neil. Uh, just wanted to say that everything that Neil went over today in the PowerPoint, he also said that he'd provide some resources. We will get that out to you guys. And again, this is a recorded video, so we'll get you the video as well in the next couple of days. If you have any further questions, Neil, if you can provide your contact info so people can get a hold of you, we'd greatly appreciate it. And again, thanks for taking the time to speak with us today. You're very welcome. I'll put my email in chat. Perfect. Uh, Denise, do you want to tell us about our speaker for next month? I do. Um, great guy, David Horning. Um, he has his own company, uh, Water Cooler Comedy. He is actually a comedian. And, you know, um, right now we need a little bit of laughter and a little bit of seriousness. Um, so he's going to put uh, the human and human resources for us. And you know what? We all need a laugh. So I think this is going to be really great. Um, you know, it's the five hallmarks of demotivating transitional management, um, uh, results driven improv based collaboration strategies. You know, it sounds, you know, like it's boring, but I swear to you, it won't be. Um, I talked to him on the phone. He is completely hilarious. So I want everybody to join. Um, and you know, get your coworkers to join. This one's gonna be fun. And like I said, we could all use a big laugh right now. Things are starting to go back to normal though. It's June 10th, as you can see in the chat, we put the link on there and the time and date. We hope to see you there and thank you again for your time today. Take care, everybody.